universe has rules, many rules. Rules like gravity, magnetism, cause and effect. Don'ts, don'ts, and more don'ts. But what if those rules could be bent, or even broken, or worse yet, discover that they were never rules at all? Einstein described the universe as a four-dimensional fabric that warps and bends and in some cases folds in on itself. But if fabric is just a matrix, even a four-dimensional one, and what if changes could magic simply put is the manipulation of the physical world without using the physical laws. The working of a ritual is intended to bring about a change that was not created from natural laws of cause and effect, but rather based on desire. One of magic's most peculiar aspects is the arbitrary nature of its rituals and preparations. Often in magic, one must prepare strain as the patience to serve a mortal in this fashion. And is this service voluntary or forced? And why symbols and incantations anyway? Why should a spirit care which direction you're facing, which chants you make in long forgotten languages, which symbols you're gazing upon, and where the stars are? Do the beings force themselves to execute the will of those with these special symbols and special chants? Or has this servitude been forced upon them? One struggles to envision any sentient being enforcing against themselves. Do they choose to be chained to these symbols and preparations? Would they choose otherwise? But oh, to be free. Not to have to go, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? To be my and indeed, even the most benign exorcisms of the Christian, Catholic, and Islamic churches is still just magic. There's nothing special about the sound waves produced during these prayers that forces a demon from his host. So some other force must lie in wait. For within the pages of the Necronomicon lie the very secrets of the universe, both past and future. Many authors have written a Necronomicon of their own, but the original was written by an Arab named Abdul Al Hazred, and was later translated by Dr. John Dee in the 16th Necronomicon, was said to have written it in the 8th century at the age of 76, just before his death in Damascus. Described by this deepest of deep insiders, came straight out of the matrix. A world where the soul and the body can part, and the soul can travel the universe while the body waits idle. And if either body dies while you're plugged into the matrix, you're gone. A world where beings just outside of our sight feed off the etheric energy of man. A world full of beings who live not in the spaces known to man, but in the angles and spaces between. Beings called maskin, who scavenge, ready to drag away the souls of the dead, beings who live in timeless kingdoms beneath the earth and seas, and even beings among us in human disguise. The next is kingdom upon the earth, from which he will lead an army that will bring a war to the front door of God himself. According to a story, his introduction into the world of magic and the unseen began on a rather mysterious night that he would later sum up in one word, Cthulhu. He was walking through the mountains at night when he stumbled across a large gray stone demon. He claims to have opened portals and walked into all the dimensions and passed all nine gates. During his travels through by all except the worshippers of the ancient ones or the demons, what you're about to hear are the secret teachings of the Illuminati. An easy way to think of extra dimensions and the beings that reside in them is birds and humans. Because of gravity, humans are subject to a two-dimensional surface, bound to the surface of a fabric. A wall, 12 feet high or more, can block his way. A bird, on the other hand, would not be bound by a 12-foot wall, or even a 30-foot wall. A bird would have to be contained in an additional way, and having access to the third dimension, so must their cage be three-dimensional. Now if you were to attempt to attack a bird who is say pecking the ground for worms, he would be within your grasp and forever in potential danger as long as he is within 12 feet of the ground. Now there's nothing special about the air above your head, and the 12 feet to the left and the right is no different than 12 feet straight up. They can both be easily measured in the same units and contain the same combination of gases. So what's different about 12 feet straight up? You don't have access to that dimension. Now there's nothing mystical about the current location of the bird, and there's nothing mystifying about the direction he just moved, and there's certainly nothing mysterious about a bird itself, aside from the surviving the things they eat. It has the same needs and similar vulnerabilities. Its parts are what you would call material, or quote unquote real. This is a very easy way of thinking about ghosts and demons. The reason you can't trap a ghost in a particular room, or even in the house, is the very same reason you can't contain a bird in a prison yard. 
having access to that extra dimension, the ghost will simply quote unquote fly over the walls of your home, but from your perspective, appearing to walk right through them. So why do we lose track of a ghost when it flies in the direction that we can't move? The direction the ghost is moving is the direction that we call time. With access to the time dimension, even the thickest stone wall can be walked over as if it were an infinitely thin object, like a sheet of paper. Three-dimensional objects existing in a four-dimensional universe will, whether perceivably or not, be infinitely thin on one side. So the beings vanish, like a submarine vanishes from those on boats as the submarine begins to move in the direction that the boat cannot. And there's nothing mystical about a submarine either. But this lofty viewpoint in the time dimension may have another effect, the perception of simultaneity. Imagine a man walking in the woods and a bird flying 500 feet above him. Now there's a lake a mile away. The man can't see it, and so by consequence, the lake is 20 minutes in his future. But the bird can already see the lake, so what is in that man's future is already part of the bird's present. Equally, things and places that the man thinks are in his past are simply a glance away for the bird. Although it has a good view of things that will layers below and above us, and these universes are called spheres, each of these extra dimensions may be accessed through a gate, and this gate is created during the ritual. The Necronomicon speaks of seven spheres outside of our own and a gate to enter each of them. You must access gates in their proper order. For instance, you may not meet the sun god who resides in the fourth sphere until you've passed the third gate, which belongs to Inanna, aka Ishtar. Each sphere is ruled by a different god, and you must open the gates in the correct sequence. The structure of the universe laid down by the Kabbalah is a tradition that suggests that the universe actually has separate universes, and these are called sephirah. The Kabbalah teaches that the whole universe is based on balance and that every particle in the material world has a counterpart in heaven. Kabbalists also believe that God has made previous universes, but those universes failed. The Necronomicon speaks of nine gates total. The first seven are part of what's called the inner world, while the last two are part of what's called the outer, where the darkest of the dark entities live. In the movie The Nine Gates with Johnny Depp, a book called The Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows includes instructions for the first eight gates of the passage. The correct ritual to pass the ninth gate, however, is cryptically hidden in not one, but three books. In the beginning of the movie, the viewer finds themselves going down a dark path, passing nine gates as the pre-film credits roll, and, as you approach the ninth gate, you walk into illumination. In the movie, the book The Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows was based on another fictional text called the Delomenomicon. While studying the black arts in Prague, he acquired a copy of the dread Delomelanicon. This is Torquia's adaptation of that work, which was written by Lucifer himself. After they burned him at the stake, a secret society was founded to perpetuate its memory and preserve its secrets. Delomenomicon sounds a lot like the Necronomicon. And, just like in the movie, Abdul al Hazrat is conspicuously vague about the details of the Ninth Gate. It's quite clear that the book from the movie, The Ninth Gate, The Nine Gates of the Kingdom of Shadows, is actually a reference to the Necronomicon. al Hazrat hints that these beings we call demons, who live outside the mortal world, exist in strange time. As long as we get you home before it's midnight in the mortal world. But that's only two hours from now. Well, don't panic, dear. You see, time works differently in Halloween Town. Two hours there might be two days here, or two weeks if we're on vacation. He states that the spirits live in an extra dimension that is wrapped inside every point in space. Beyond the gate dwell now the old ones, not in the spaces known unto men, but in the angles betwixt them. You're a prisoner? It's all part and parcel of the whole genie gig. Phenomenal cosmic powers! The worst demons have been banished to a place called the Agigi, a place where, with their leader Azagthoth, they wait for a celestial event that heralds their coming. For a wizard to venture forth into the pit in safety, he must first sell his soul and remove his name from the stars. These beings, called the Ancient Ones, did incredible evils on the earth and were cast to the Agigi by the Elder Lords Enki, Anu, Enlil, and Marduk. The Necronomicon speaks of these spheres as if they are wandering. It leads on to the fact that when the fabric of two spheres touches, the beings and objects in those parts of the two universes can interact during this time. If these collisions are rhythmic, it may explain why certain beings can only be invoked on certain nights. Perhaps even the moon's weight may press upon the fabric of space-time, further closing the distance between our plane of existence and another. The Necronomicon's Ladder of Lights, with its seven steps, is very similar to the Kabbalistic Ladder, with its seven steps. 
The Kabbalists even attribute the various steps on the ladder with the same planet the Necronomicon does. A ladder with seven steps to the heavens also occurs in the old Persian and Hindu religion. Or what about the Masonic ladder, the ladder of Kadash? Or Jacob's ladder from the Bible? For instance, here's Genesis chapter 28, 12. And he dreamed, and behold a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. These gates are even referred to as seven seals, just like the seven seals from the book of Revelation. Another fascinating aspect of the book is the Necronomicon's inclusion of a recipe for LSD, which Abdul al Hazrid called Space Mead. The mixture is made from the soaking of crushed morning glory seeds in wood alcohol for two days, removing the mush created and allowing the residual fluid to evaporate, leaving behind a yellowish resin. The mush removed earlier should then be re-soaked, strained out again, and the resulting mixture allowed to evaporate, as was done before. He suggests that only 30 grams of this compound is enough to provide astral flight for the body. The Necronomicon is a real grab bag of mythologies. Biblical, Babylonian, and Islamic symbolism and concepts are all drawn from freely, but the Necronomicon's main parallels are Kabbalistic and Sumerian. The gods, for the most part, are referred to in their Sumerian names. First, the bad gods. Now, the Necronomicon doesn't always speak in a black and white manner regarding the morality of a certain character, god, or race, but for the most part, it does. Alhazred never fails to mention when a certain god, demon, watcher or race is hostile to mankind and will give warnings proportional to the danger. Cthulhu is a character made famous by H.P. Lovecraft. Many descriptions of Cthulhu parallel the Antichrist from the Bible. Even Aleister Crowley associated Cthulhu with the Beast 666. Like the Antichrist from the Bible, Cthulhu is said to be dead but dreaming, and also similar to the Antichrist, his idle body will rise from the sea and establish his kingdom on earth. Cthulhu is one of the few gods who cannot be conjured but can, during ritual, possess someone who is present. From there, the possessed host will witness the dreams and thoughts of Cthulhu. Cthulhu is considered the priest of the Old Ones and one of their main leaders. The reason for Cthulhu worship is only so that he'll be partial to you when he rises from the sea and establishes his kingdom on earth. Just like in the movie Dagon, Ea Cthulhu is one of the most common incantations in the Necronomicon. Yog Sathoth is an all seeing eye kind of character. He is the key master and the gate between the worlds. He is described more specifically as the gate the old ones will return to earth through. It is said that all time and space are one to him. Beneath him are 13 globes or servants of Yog Sathoth. These are demons, which after a ritual, will bestow one of many various gifts. Then there's Azikthoth, the blind mad god. This god is described as extremely powerful, insane, a black magician, and leader of the old ones. At the center of all infinity, the center of the universe, he dwells with his multitudes. He is the lord of chaos, and once he is invoked, he is virtually impossible to put back in his land. Alhazred warns against the summoning of this god, when the stars are in their correct places, and when our sphere nears Agigi, Azagthoth will lead the Old Ones out of the Abyss. This prophetic event has been witnessed in countless movies. 